we are excited and honored to have Zarka Nawaz, author, broadcaster, filmmaker, wife, and mother of four here today. Zarka is the creator of Little Mosque on the Prairie, the world's first, first sitcom about a Muslim community living in the West. It premiered the record ratings on CBC and is broadcast in 60 countries. Zarka is also creator of the groundbreaking national film board documentary, Me and the Mosque. It is about a Muslim, about Muslim women's battle with patriarchy in the mosque. Zarka is also the author of Laughing All the Way to the Mosque, a memoir. We are very pleased to have Zarka as our keynote speaker for Daughters' Day. Can you hear me? Am I loud enough? It's such an honor to be here in Edmonton. I've been here several times and I'm always amazed by the graciousness and hospitality of my guests. It is, you know, so incredible to, to see so many wonderful friends again and again um, celebrating women and human rights and social justice. It's so wonderful. I'd like to acknowledge that I come from Treaty 4 territory, which is Regina, Saskatchewan and that I am here in Treaty 6 territory, and I'd like to acknowledge the rich history of Métis and First Nations people that have been here before you know, all of us, and that I am a newcomer to this land, and I always want to um, remember that whenever I give my speeches. And I'd like to say that I am the oldest of three children and the only daughter in my family. My father lived in India during the partition when Pakistan was created. His family had to flee, leaving everything, home, property, job, land, to start all over again. He was 15 years old. He realized that he, being the eldest son in the family, would have to save his family from endemic poverty. And he educated himself and became an engineer. And he moved to England, where he worked on the Mercy Tunnels in Liverpool. Have you guys heard of the Mercy Tunnels? My father was one of the first engineers who worked on those tunnels. And he sent all his money as his tradition back home to Pakistan where his parents raised, you know, the family and all the brothers and sisters and got them educated. And he wouldn't come back home, you know, to take care of his own life. He felt this was his, he had to spend the rest of his life supporting his family. But then suddenly he got a call from, you know, from his parents saying that his father was dying and on his deathbed and he had to rush back home. So we got to the airport only to be greeted by a band and a wedding party and a shiny new bride. <laughs> and this is what we call old school arranged marriage where you don't even, not that you don't even, you don't even know your bride, you don't even know you're getting married. <laughs> it was the only way they could marry my father off because he was very typical of his generation and felt that he needed to stay in England and forever work and send money back home. So he came back with a shiny new bride and his friends in England said, so how is your father doing? And he goes, apparently he was perfectly fine, but this is my new wife. <laughs> I guess in those days, immigration was very different. Your family your reunification seemed instant because you could do those sort of things. But what he realized very quickly was that a lot of his female relatives had gotten married very early in their lives and had not had a chance to become educated and it had limited their economic potential. And he became obsessed, like a lot of fathers in that generation did, with their daughters and the education of their daughters. And the number one occupation that immigrant fathers choose for their daughters is medicine. So my father became obsessed with me becoming a doctor and going to medical school. And it was an obsession, let me tell you. He used to introduce me to any doctor that he met and ask him if he would be my reference for when I got into medical school. And I was only in kindergarten, right? And so I was being groomed at a very, very early age. But it wasn't just medical school that he was um, grooming me for. He would tell me over and over again that I was smart and beautiful and confident and I could speak well. And he would go on and on about my abilities. And he would never, interestingly enough, 
say any of those things to my two younger brothers. It wasn't until years later I understood why. He didn't have to. Society and culture were already telling them those things. In fact, so much so that it would become a problem for young men. Interestingly enough, I was just reading, before I came here, I read an article in Forbes magazine, that magazine about um, famous people who are in business. And there was, um, there's a guy called Max Tucker. Have you heard of him? He's a famous angel investor. So he invests in startups. And he, de he recently decided to give up. Um, giving money to startups and this is the reason that he said in terms of why he gave up giving money to startups particularly to young entrepreneurs they're young and arrogant and inexperienced and their little bit of success went right to their heads and so they think they know everything I'm watching two amazing ideas that should grow into amazing companies get destroyed by inexperience and arrogance of their young founders and this drives me nuts side note they're both young males and young males are especially susceptible to this. I like investing in young female CEOs and older CEOs of either gender, much more than younger males. In my experience, they listen to people, they don't assume they know everything, and they make smart decisions based on good principles, not ego-driven impulses. Studies bear out the wisdom of this preference. Both women do better and experienced people do better at starting companies than young men and the best venture capital capitalists in the world agree. I should also mention that I have two sons and yes, they both hate it when I give speeches like these. <laughs> they feel like they are the ones who are suffering and oppressed at home <laughs> with two older sisters who make fun of them endlessly for being boys. But as their father tells them, they're going to be okay, and the stats worldwide bear that out. Somehow entitlement and confidence seem to be encoded in their DNA, and the world rewards them for it. But my father recognized early on, as a young girl, that he needed to push me to succeed and to believe in myself. And in fact, he may have become a little too obsessed. I grew up with an incredible feeling that education was the single most important goal in my life. My father believed that women were the key to society's future, and he wasn't half wrong. According to the UN, women who are employed typically invest 90% of their earnings in their families, particularly their children's education compared to men who only plow between 30 to 40% of their earnings into their families. So even a humble increase in the opportunities made available to women can lead to significant economic and social benefits. In short, empowering women changes not only the family, but society. And I want to emphasize, men are not terrible. But when terrible things do happen, most of the time they're happening to women. We have thousands of disappeared Aboriginal women in this country. Social, economic, and political disparity still exists. And it's often assumed by people living here in North America that women over there have it so much worse. And I'd like to mention that Hillary Clinton's running for the Republican nomination is a really big deal in the US. She may become the first woman president of the United States. But what we forget is that both India and Pakistan had democratically elected women as heads of states decades before that. In fact, the sitting Prime Minister of Bangladesh today is a woman. We tend to think that women have achieved equality living here in the West, so much so that when the story about Gian Gomeshi sexual abuse of women came to light, more and more women started to have the courage to start telling the stories of abuse and rape and sexual harassment. And many felt they could not go to the authorities because they wouldn't be taken seriously or it would affect their job prep prospects. It became apparent from all these stories that were coming out in the media that there's still a problem when it comes to women being abused by men in authority. And then the same story started to play out in the United States when the, the revelations of Bill Cosby's abuse came to light. What this means is that even here in this continent, we still have a long way to go in every society and in every culture when it comes to gender equity quality. As you will probably guess by now, I didn't become a doctor, and yes, it broke my father's heart. But what my father did do was he inculcated a strong sense of ambition and drive in me. It was the type of confidence and push I needed to get over that failure and pick myself up again and try again in another career. And then I found a husband who was interested in a strong woman who had ambition. 
I started to have children, and this was my great father's greatest worry. He had seen so many women get worn down by looking after their family that they lost a sense of who they were and what their dreams were. Women sacrifice so much for their families. Often they sacrifice themselves and their dreams. But I had a husband, a man, who was my greatest support and cheerleader during these years. And I say this because there's a popular song out right now called Cheerleader. Have you guys heard of this song? Who's the name of the, um, the artist that sings this song? Does anyone know? Yeah? What's his name? Okay. So you know what the song, I guess the older people don't know this song. It's called Cheerleader. All the young people here, after my speech, I want to play this song. And it's got this incredible tune. It's a fantastic song. But, you know, it bothers me a little bit, right? Because it encourages women to be in the supportive role in the relationship, if you listen to the lyrics really carefully. And I feel that sometimes that, you know, women being a cheerleader of their man sort of sends this subliminal message in our culture about women's role is in a relationship. But I was really fortunate that I had a husband who felt that he wanted to be my cheerleader. And so we made a decision to put our children in daycare, which was a really, really big deal for my mother's generation because they felt that kids would suffer and it was a mother's job to do this solely. But I can tell you from my experience that as long as children are in a safe and loving environment, they don't really care. And my children took more pride in my achievements as a writer and as a filmmaker than they ever would have as a mother who gave up her dreams. After not getting into medical school, I made a move into making short films. My first one was entitled Death Threat, which was about a young Muslim woman who wanted to get her first book published. She couldn't find a single publisher who was willing to take on her book, so she decided to get a death threat on purpose because this would attract the media. So she couldn't find anyone in her Muslim community who was willing to sentence her to death. So she decided to take a shortcut to fame, and she found out that at the local university, a group of Hamas were giving a lecture, only men invited. So she decided to write out her own death threat and she just needed someone there to sign it. So she got to the university and she found out that she had misread the poster and it wasn't the Hamas. It was a cooking class for hummus. <laughs> <laughs> but she still persevered and she had her death threat and she sent the ch um, chickpea uh, guy who was sending the chickpeas, he, she sent the delivery guy away and she got the cooking instructors assigned her death threat and then publicity ensued and it, she got exactly what she wanted. So it was a comedy about taking Muslim stereotypes and turning them upside down. After the success of that film, I decided to make a documentary entitled Me in the Mosque about patriarchy and mosques where women didn't have equal access to prayer spaces. But what I made clear in this documentary was that tradition and Islam, tradition, it was a tradition and not Islam that was the problem. Men had mistaken theology, they had, they had decided to mistake tradition for theology, and that this was a problem that was going on in many different religions around the world, that men used faith to give a sheen of legitimacy to patriarchy. After making this documentary, I was asked to go to the BAMP television festival. A friend of mine told me that people usually go there to pitch TV series. After making this documentary, I thought of an idea of where an imam who wasn't encumbered by patriarchy or a culture that was trying to put women down, but he decided he wanted to create a mosque where women wanted to go, where it was an empowering place for women to go. What would, that, what would a mosque like that look like? So that was where the idea of Little Mosque of the Prairie was born. I pitched it, and CBC decided to take the idea and put it into production. When the show first aired, there was a media frenzy from all over the world. People thought it was a crazy idea to make a comedy about Muslims because it was coming just two years after the Dutch controversy over the cartoons of the Prophet. People thought Muslims would flip cars and protest in Toronto. The truth is, some Muslims were a little upset to see their dirty, air, dirty laundry aired on television. But in true Canadian fashion, they signed a petition of protest instead. <laughs> The show did talk about sexism and racism and extremism in the community, but it also dealt with subjects of Islamophobia outside as well. We had one episode where the Muslims in Mercy wanted to build a grave site so they could all be buried in the same grave. So they, this was actually based on a true story. So all the Muslims went to the grave site 
and they thought, wow, this is a you know, nice piece of land. They lay down, and they, Muslims, we lie down, we, we are buried facing Mecca on our right sides. So I had all the people in the town of Mercy lay down, face right, and they're looking up and they're thinking, you know, about their deaths in their grave site. And Bobber looks up and he sees a saloon which sells alcohol, and he stands up and he goes, no, I can't have my death ruined by white people drinking alcohol looking at my dead body. So he runs to the saloon and he says, I need a demand that you shut this saloon down. And the people were like, well, how do we feel drinking alcohol being stared at by a bunch of dead Muslims? <laughs> So it was a comedy about how we fused together Canadian culture and Muslim culture and created a brand new culture of the two communities coming together. When this show aired, the ratings came in and it was the highest ratings the CBC had since a show called Anne of Avonlea aired 20 years previously. <laughs> it was the first time in the Western world that a show about the average life of Muslims was being depicted. Muslims who were trying to pay their mortgage, raise their kids, deal with their neighbors, the stuff of ordinary people. If a show like this was made about any other group, it would have been too boring to put on the air because it was about Muslims, the show, a group, a group of people that was so demonized in the media that the banality became revolutionary. And the president of the CBC at the time wrote in his memoir, Little Mosque on the Prairie saved the corporation. I look back on those years, and those were not easy years to be sure, but it was a father who had raised me, his only daughter, to believe in myself and to take on the world and never give up. And we're here today in celebration of all daughters because in front of all strong men stand even stronger women. Thank you very much.